Okay, maybe that's better. All right, so get up and greet each other. You got quiet for that. We're going to do our memory verse. Anyone have it memorized? It's such a hard one. Good job, Mr. Williams. All right. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And it's found in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. That's an if-then promise, isn't it? If we do our part, then he is going to do his part. And what do we have to do? We've got to humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways. Doesn't sound too hard, right? I had a thought this morning, and I know Jesus put it in my heart. It was, who is your God? Who's your God this morning? Is it anger? Is it pride? False pride? False humility? Is it God himself? Well, I got angry this morning. No, Daryl had nothing to do with it. I was printing 150 bulletins and the ink ran out. And when did it run out? I have no idea. I had about 25 that were good. And it's not that it's such a big thing, but on Sunday morning, it's a huge thing. <laughs> huge, big, huge. All right, let's stand up and sing God Bless America. Finally found a way to turn him off. <laughs> You're welcome. Test, test, test. I know when she said that, that she was angry, that you guys thought it was me. They did. You? I heard some. So did I. <laughs> God is good. He Amen. is good to each one of us. 
um, he uses us in miraculous ways. And as I preach today, I'll get into that. But through our bulletins, I want you to pick up your bulletin and just look at the prayer request. Um, Bill Elliott, many of you know him. He's recovering, and um, he's probably going to go to Germany for an operation. But right now, we just want to be praying that he gets strength back. Vicki Wiggins, you're going to have your knee done Friday. And Vicki works the sale, so everybody's concerned. <laughs> now we're going to miss you in the sale for sure. Uh, on down the list, Steve Taylor with uh, cancer. Be praying for him. The diagnosis just came in, so he's on his way to MD Anderson. Gary Praker, uh, recovering from uh, a bypass. Margaret Greenhill and Martha Coulterman. Just these folks, when you go down this list, whether you know them or not, I just uh, ask you to pray for them. It's one of the many ways that God brings people to himself is through answered prayer. So as we go down this list, be praying for those folks. We have uh, anniversaries with Mike and Linda Joyner, Cliff and Glenna Lambert, and Julio and Carmen Romero on this list. Remember this next week, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock service next week. Because of the derby starts at noon, it gives us time. We also have a special guest singer, Paul Smith, from the Imperials. He'll be leading the music, and so it'll be just a great uh, service of worship next week, 10 o'clock. Sunday school is canceled next week um, so because of the early time. So with all those things, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, I thank you so much that you are so good. You're so wonderful. You do mighty and great works in our life and the lives of those we love and those around us. I pray that you will continue to, to reveal your will to each one of us. I pray for just the races, this big week for this track, Lord, that you will just go before all that takes place. We ask that you just guide us. Give us your guidance in the big plan and the little plan, Lord. Teach us to wait on you and to trust in you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As the men come forward to take the offering, you know, this, is, this ministry has been so blessed. We've been able to do a lot. We have calendars, uh, just a few here today, but there'll be uh, calendars for sale. And we just, uh, we've just been blessed, and thank you for your blessing. Just how far the east is from the west 
one to the other I know you've washed me white Turned my darkness into night I need your peace to get me through To get me through this night I can't live by what I feel But by your truth your word reveals I'm not holding on to you But you're holding on to me How far the east is from the west Cause I can't bear to see who I've been Come rising up in me again In the arms of your mercy I find rest Cause you know just how far the east is from the west One scarred hand to the other Amen. Isn't that right? When he forgives our sins. How far is one hand from the other? Can you reach your hands together? Mm -mm. He forgives them all. Praise his name. All right, we're going to sing. He's got the whole world in his hand. Because we can. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got that little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got little bitty baby in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got everybody here in his hands he's got everybody here in his hands he's got everybody here in his hands he's got the whole Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yeah. Do you believe it? Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praise stream Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior from church here I heard the little echo for the men that's pretty cool this song Daryl sent me the name of the song because Catherine had it on her website last year I guess a year ago her daughter got kicked by a horse and she is perfectly fine today and it's called he touched me and maybe you need a touch today from him. He can touch you right where you are.
Can you imagine? I wasn't going to do this one because I can't get the intro yet. So you guys just have to bear with it. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine I can only imagine I can only imagine when that day comes
I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. Oh God, it takes a pretty good imagination to think about heaven. We've heard of pearly gates and streets of gold and that all our tears are going to be a pond and, or a lake, depending on how much we cry or don't cry. But to be in front of you, Lord, it doesn't take any imagination. You're here right now with us. We may not be able to see you, but Father, you are here among us. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. You are the only true God, and we thank you. We thank you for loving us so much. And now we just want to worship you in spirit, in thought, in deed. Open our hearts, open our minds, and change us somehow today, Joel. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As I was preparing for this, I talked to Steve Drypolcher, or Peter Drypolcher. I had talked to you about him last week. He's a missionary, retired in Chicago, reaches out to the lost people in that community. So I called him up and I said, Pete, what is it? Peter is his excellent name. Peter, what is it that you see brings people to Christ? What is it that you do, or how does God use you to do that? And he said, Daryl, I can, I can break that down for you, but a man has already done that for us. His name was Fuller. And he did a survey. And in that survey, it's what draws unbelievers to Christ. And it goes down a list, and it talks about um, the biblical truth in Scripture, that as people begin to read or hear the word, they, they, it resonates as truth. Or the life or teachings of Jesus is another, another way. Another way is the community of the church, belonging. That's one of them. But Fuller said the number one thing, 51% of people that come to Christ are drawn by the love of Christ through believers. 51%. And so as we go out amongst our neighbors, our friends, and our family, it's the love of Christ being demonstrated through you that is going to have the greatest impact as you bring them first love and then truth and then community as you invite them in and then sharing that life of Christ with them. In 1 Corinthians 13, this is a chapter, uh, I did a wedding up at the prayer garden on Friday and I read part of this verse to this couple, so you've probably heard it at weddings. I'm not going to read that particular part, but it talks about love is not jealous, you've heard that before. You know, that was Paul, when he was writing that, he didn't write that for uh, weddings. He wrote that for you and I within the church, that we love one another, that we don't have jealousy of one another, that the truth will win out as it promises. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 and 11 through 13 says, If I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong, or a clanging symbol. If I have a gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away those childish things behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then shall I know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. 
but the greatest of these is love. That is our primary purpose, is to love the way God has purposed us to love. I am going to have a bad connection here. Let me try this other one. How's that? Not on. Well, I will just keep going this way. Just that little bit of, I'll try to be still. <laughs> that primary focus is how we treat others. You know, I was going through that series about the fruits of the Spirit. And Paul is talking here about gifts of the Spirit, which are the way we actively minister to one another. Some of us are gifted as teachers or preachers. Some as servants in the church um, to serve one another. But those gifts mean nothing if we don't have love out front. If we do it for any other reason, and that love, you think, oh, that's easy. I can just love. We'll put you in some situations where love is very hard, and you'll see that you need God. You need God's love, that unconditional love, that can love another that's different than you are. As we talked last week, someone of a different skin color or a different um, nation they come from, but to truly have love and not to prejudge. Richard McBrien says, love is the soul of the Christian experience. It is the heart of every other Christian virtue. It's the heart of it. Thus, for example, justice without love is legalism. And I've been around Christians that are legalistic. But when you have love, you can nurture. Faith without love is ideology. Hope without love is self-centeredness. Forgiveness without love is self-abasement. Fortitude without love is recklessness. Generosity without love is extravagance. Care without love is mere duty. Fidelity without love is servitude. Every virtue is an expression of love. No virtue is really a virtue unless it is permeated or informed by love. That love unites a church. That love makes your relationships flourish. That love conquers hatred. That love casts out fear. Scripture says and promises that. It overcomes evil. It does all that God promises. It endures. As that verse says, it endures through all things. We always equate power with control. And I know that we get off track with power. We can begin to think that we are the only one that is right or we're the only one that can do it a certain way which is right. But love steps in. When we truly love, it steps in and it slows us down to be able to listen, to hear, to respond in a way that God has called us to. It's the true power of the Christian walk is to have the love of God working through you, in you. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How does that happen and how does it look? What are these kinds of love? We have love between friends and brothers, that kind of brotherly love. We have love in a family, in a community. We have physical love, self-sacrificing love. And that's really the love we're getting at today. It's that agape love, God's love, his love for us that moves through us to others. It's his love that caused Christ to go to the cross because he loved us so much. And when we, when we can put the weight of that kind of love inside of us, when he comes and dwells in us, we show that kind of love to those around us. It's the power. It's the power not to control, but to be controlled by God. To understand that it's him that is loving through you. And that's why that we always talk about the being quiet before God, being still, listening to God. Being in his word, understanding his word, that all comes about as we have that love in us and through us. There's four things that I'll talk about today, and it's the power, the power of the incarnation, God with us, the power of the resurrection, God for us, and the power of sanctification, God in us, and the power of vocation, it's God working through us. And that first one, that incarnation, when you think about Christ coming to earth to show us what God is like. When you read the Gospels, they're in there for us to see, read, and understand what God is like because 
Christ in Philippians 2, it says, Though being in the very nature of God, he became a man and took on the very nature of a servant. Right before our eyes as we read scripture, we can see what God is like. We can see how Jesus approached those around him to heal and to minister and the way he did that. The way he reached those that were in the deepest of sin and forgave those sins. He reached out, but he did it all in love. The love of the Father through the Son. The love of God here on earth. God with us. In John 1.14 it says, The Word, that is Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So we can see clearly that Christ was tempted in every way that we are, but without sin. We know that he experienced the pain that we experience, the loneliness that we experience, the loneliness of Gethsemane. When he prayed that, Father, take this cup from me, he knew what was coming. He did it because of that love. We can see God in Christ see exactly what he's like and be drawn to him he becomes visible becomes visible through his word and through Christians like you and I he becomes visible through a church like this one with a mission not just to do good for goodness sake but to do good because it shows the love of Christ being spread across this whole racetrack God is visible that way. He's visible through our good works. And those good works are prompted by his love. Are they not? When you know how much he loves you, when you get a clear picture of what God is like, and you begin to see that love is so strong that you can, it'll raise you up. It'll cause you when you're in your darkest moments to know you have a friend, to know that Jesus is there with a listening ear to hear your prayer, and to answer with the promises of Scripture for you and I. There was a little boy, 11-year-old boy named Trevor, and he had seen homeless people when he was coming uh, home from school, and he asked his parents, he said, could we give those extra blankets out of the garage to these men and women that are on the streets? And his parents, okay. So they started, they handed out some blankets. Trevor enjoyed that so much and they saw that he went on this mission and he started gathering from neighbors blankets and making peanut butter sandwiches to hand out and so every Saturday they would take Trevor down on the streets and he would give to these homeless people. It became a a news thing. Uh, Merv Griffith and Ronald Reagan, this was a while back, Mother Teresa, Pat Robertson, they all wanted to interview Trevor and talk about what What was causing him to have this heart for the homeless? They wanted to meet him. And when they had a chance to talk to him, he said, it's Jesus. It's Jesus with me. It's Jesus that makes me want to do this. And I think in any ministry of service, which we're all called to do, it's going to be that very thing. It's because of Jesus. He compels me. He is real. Trevor made God real by his acts of service and kindness. God with us. Not theology, but it's when theology becomes a reality. The power of love expressed around us, with us. And that resurrection, that's God for us. You know, without the resurrection, we'd believe in vain. Because it's that resurrection that conquers death. It's that resurrection that proves that God is who he says he is. He rose from the dead. He lived a perfect life and rose from the dead, endured the cross for our behalf so that we could find forgiveness. And that was one of the points in a, in a person coming to Christ is that they, they are looking for forgiveness. And when they hear the message of the cross, the message of the love of the cross, of bringing forgiveness, it draws unbelievers to him, and it draws us to him closer, a closer walk with him. And we know that no matter what we face, no matter whatever failures we have, that God is for us. He is for us. Lee Strobel, well, first I'll read 1 Corinthians 15, 14. It said, if Christ is not risen, 
we have believed in vain. That was kind of the paraphrase. That's the verse that I paraphrased. Lee Strobel is a writer. He was a journalist from Chicago, and he was an unbeliever. And he was just a skeptic. But as a journalist, he said, well, I'm going to search this out. So he started studying the life of Christ. He started reading about the resurrection, started reading about Easter and, and all the things in Scripture. And he researched them back through other writers of that period, the Bible itself. And he realized that Jesus lives. He not only lived, but he lives. He became a great writer. He is a great writer, a C.S. Lewis of our day. He wrote A Case for Christ, if you've ever read that book. He knew that Jesus was alive, that he is not only with us, but he is in us and for us. And that last, that third thing is God in us, and that's uh, sanctification, which is a word none of us like to hear. Do it. It's kind of that cleansing work of God. It's the growth that we experience. We have a salvation experience when we come to Christ, but it's not over yet. He begins to work in us and, and bring those things out that are displeasing to him, the sin in our life. He not only forgives them, but he gives us the power to overcome those that we begin to experience a life of sanctification. Not perfect, but a life where God is cleaning us, cleansing us, so we become vessels worthy of the message that he has given each one of us. We're called out of that darkness and into light. And he does a marvelous work. You know, in your church, it may be Bible studies, Sunday school, places that you can gather in fellowship and get that deeper walk. Buchanan says we're no longer hell-bent, but heaven-bound. And in that direction of heading to heaven, God is continually making us more like his son. That salvation experience, coming to Jesus, sanctification, becoming like him, glorification, what Melanie was singing about, across the finish line, changed in an instant. That second you put your faith in Christ, that salvation came into your life and the work begun. Ruth Graham, Billy and Ruth Graham were in a car riding along and they came to a construction uh, on the highway. And they patiently waited through that construction and at the very end it said, construction ended, thanks for your patience. She turned to Billy and she said, I want that on my grave marker. And it is there. He had that put on there just as her request. She requested. Instruction ended. You see, it's never over. We're constantly, you know, we kind of say, hey, I'm over this. I'm over that anger. And then next thing you know, you're losing your temper. But God is working, continually working to remind us our need for him, the work he is doing, and the end game. He's making us like his son more and more influenced by the Holy Spirit to shape our attitudes to become more and more like his son to love others the way Jesus loves that's a high bar to abide in him that's how you're going to learn that love when you're abiding when you're close to him and to bear fruit as we've talked about over the last weeks to bear fruit for him glorify God by our life understanding that his love was great for each one of us, enough to prompt him to go to the cross. Buchanan says, pride can make you religious, guilt can make you moral, duty can make you decent, but only love can make you holy. Only love can make you look and act and be as Jesus. And folks, we need that in our world today. We need people that are touched. Just like that song. I, I remember singing that song as a young man. He touched me. Did everybody know that song? It's a wonderful song, not only to worship, but to be reminded that he touched me. He touched me through the love of other Christians. When I didn't know who Christ was, he touched me through that love and brought me to himself and began a work in me as I've stumbled along at times. I put him to work pretty hard. <laughs> but I'm thankful for every time he's disciplined me, every time 
he's brought a, something into my life that's revealed those things that I need to change. It's a wonderful process of sanctification. Wonderful. And the last thing is that vocation. It's God working through us. And that's where you become amazed. When you see God working through other Christians, when God works through you and has great effect on the mission of the church, his mission in the world, when you see people like Peter, Peter Drypulcher up in Chicago with a passion to reach the lost, when I think about my uncle with his passion, I listen to a tape on, from him on the Father's love to kind of prepare for this sermon. And he preached powerfully about God's love, the heart of God, that sanctifying, transforming love that will change you and I for the kingdom work, that he can work through us. It's God saying to you, I have great plans for you. I have plans and assignments for you, and I'm preparing you for those things. I've saved you. And I'm cleaning you up, but I want to employ you. That's God's work in each one of us, those stages to compel us to work for him, to love for him, to be obedient, to do that kingdom work that he's called each of us to. Do you want more? I always want more. I know I haven't arrived. And I don't think anybody in this room says, oh, I've got all that. We all know we'll keep going on. That construction is not done yet for each one of us. And as he's working in you, it should put joy in your heart that he loves you, that he gave Christ to us in the incarnation, that in that resurrection he showed his power, that same power that raised him from the dead, what's the scripture say? Dwells in you. It's a powerful verse. Sanctification, that he's got that work going on inside each one of us and then he puts us out in vocation doesn't mean you're going to be a preacher but he's got a plan for you it may be preaching you never know until you go God use me I am yours use me for your kingdom but most of all folks with um, this meet coming to an end many of you will go back to your churches and I want you to go back so full of God's love that you turn your church upside down. If it's sleeping, wake them up. If they have a lack for missions, there's work to be done. God has assignments for each one of us. And in sending Jesus, he's shown us how great that love is, that he can save the greatest of sinners, the most lost he will save. And he takes away that sting of death as promised. And he gives us an abundant life with purpose. As Melanie comes forward to, to close with a song, that's the things I want you to think about. That love of God. Have you experienced that salvation that he gives? Are you in the process of that sanctification? Or you kind of said, you know, God, I'm fine the way I am. Ask the person next to you if that's true. God's always working on us. He's got a wonderful plan for each one of us. And as uh, Melanie plays this song, I just want you to bow your heads. Think about what God is doing in your life. Pray that he will just come closer to you as you draw to him. He washed my eyes with tears that I may see. good for me. He tore it all apart and looked inside. He found it full of fear and foolish pride. He swept away the
thank you for this time that we have been here worshiping you, learning, Lord. May our hearts just continue to be drawn to you. I pray that you will go with each one of us, not only to protect, but to guide, to lead us, Lord, into a closer walk with thee. I pray that we will see you more clearly as we are just drawn to you, Lord. We thank you. I pray a blessing upon each one here and their families, Lord. Remind us of that great love each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.